go to either Denver or Chicago right. or Dallas. Well, good good morning, everybody, and and welcome uh, to uh, Alumni Weekend. This is the uh, KU Medical Center then and now panel discussion. Uh, its origin really starts with uh, the gold medal breakfast, which uh, back in the days where we would meet in th the third dimension, we would uh, sit with the gold medalists uh, with a panel of students and discuss uh, KU then and now. And, and uh, it's always been a very delightful opportunity to not only meet the gold medal uh, class uh, in this class of 1971, but also to uh, meet some of our best and brightest students and compare and contrast the, 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 uh, the, the life of a student uh, uh, then and now. Um, it, at the beginning of the alumni weekend, it allows us to integrate that past and present context. And it's always been exceedingly enjoyable. I always take some great stories, some of which I could probably never share again because of their frankness, and some of which uh, I, 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 I keep in file uh, uh, for, for, for future cases. Um, I always enjoy it and always get a chance to learn a lot from our current students and from our from our graduates. So we are delighted to have you here in way of introduction. Uh, my name is Rob Samari. I'm uh, uh, the executive vice chancellor. Uh, I'm uh, uh, an alumnus as well, class of uh, medical school, class of 1986, um, as we were referred to as E86. We're the extended four-year program, and we are celebrating our 35th year with a small reception uh, at our at our home this evening. So I'm both a the host and a participant in the in the alumni weekend. I was I'm a, uh, an adult cardiologist. I trained around the country, practice at the Mayo Clinic for about 25 years before returning as the executive dean in 2014. And when Dr. Gerard became chancellor, I became an executive vice chancellor in 2017. It's been my honor to serve in that role um, uh, role ever since. So we're really excited to honor our uh, alumni this weekend with a a real excitement for our gold medal class of classes of, uh, of 1971. And we're delighted to have uh, three current, um, sort of current students with us and two former students uh, from uh, those classes helping us to kick off this conversation. But we hope that this will be a open chat for everyone who's joining us today. Uh, we're delighted to have the uh, KU Medical Center alumni director, Jordan Snow with us uh, on the panel as well. And I'm gonna start by um, having our panelists uh, introduce themselves. Uh, I'm going to uh, start with our current medical student, uh, Chi Chi Gao. Who, Chi Chi, I would ask you to uh, introduce yourself, hometown, college, and where you think you're headed in medicine. Thank you for joining us, Chi Chi. Yeah, thank you for the intro, Dr. Samari. Um, my name is Chi Chi Gao, and I'm from Manhattan, Kansas, so affectionately known as the Little Apple. Um, and I am a current fourth year here at KU. It's been a delight to be part of the KU MC community, and I've loved every moment of it. I'm currently applying to a psychiatry residency, and so I hope and intend to become a future psychiatrist in um, in the near future. Chi Chi, uh, you've had a you've had a distinguished career as a medical student. Can you tell us about your initiatives in the arts that you've established here? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, so during my first year of medical school, as um, in the fall, I initiated something called Med Intima, which is a online website, but also more of a creative space for students to express themselves, but also to share their stories and also connect um, in a deeper way than what we usually interact with each other in the lecture halls and stuff. And so from that, the initiation started based on how I wanted to connect deeper with other students that I didn't get to interact with in my small group setting or in lecture space. And I'm sure we'll get into a little bit deeper of how the learning community and learning setting has changed and evolved over the past 30 years. But um, it's a, it was initially a blog and now it's a online magazine and we kind of published um, by by annual publications and sharing student art literature as well as stories that um, um, it's currently housed within the medical student, but I hope it'll expand in the future to be within the other health professions too. Chichi, thank you very much. As a as a vice chancellor, we're very proud of your efforts, and as a vascular biologist, I love the title, Med Intima. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we're joined today by uh, Shelby Moore, who plays a role as both. Uh, a uh, recent student and, a, and now a graduate uh, from the School of Nursing. Shelby, welcome. Hi, um, yeah, I'm Shelby Moore. I just graduated from uh, KU School of Nursing um, this last May, uh, 2021. 
Um, I'm now working at KU um, on HC5, which is a uh, uh, cardiovascular progressive care unit. Um, I'm working nights, which is why I'm in my, it's why I look like this right now. I work night shift, but um, I am here this morning, nonetheless. Um, in school, I was a part of KU Medicine, uh, KU Medicine or Miracle Makers, which is a group of uh, interprofessional students, uh, physical therapy, medical student and nursing students working together to raise money um, for the uh, miracle kids that are on the pediatric units at KU. Um, I was also in Froki Labs have uh, academic society for the nursing program, which is um, how I uh, got the invitation to do this. Um, we have like uh, a board of advisors and then um, the students uh, are elected into the positions and that's how. Um, That'll be where, where are you from? Oh, I'm from um, Topeka, Kansas. Topeka. Terrific. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. And, and, the, and the, the, the final student is uh, Aaron Smith, who's a health professions PhD student. Aaron, thanks for joining us. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, good morning, everyone. I grew up in the small community of Charleston, Illinois, but we are the original home of Jimmy Johns and Tony Romo and Jimmy Garoppolo played uh, football at Eastern Illinois University. So those that's are, a lot for a small town. Yeah, that, that's our claim to fame. But it's Central Illinois, about 40 miles south of Champaign, Illinois, where University of Illinois is. But I came out to Kansas City in 2018, originally for work, but then I ran into my advisor. She is the chair at the, in the medical nutrition science program, and she convinced me to stay on for a, a PhD. So my focus is in Alzheimer's and nutrition, and I'm part of the SHP Senate here in the government, and it's been a, a great couple of years. I, again, I started in, I think, July of 2019. So hopefully I'll be done in two years, depending on how long that old dissertation takes. One word at a time. That's what I've been told. Gotcha. Thanks so much, Aaron. We're, we're delighted to have a, 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 a two um, uh, alumni with us today. And our, the first is Dr. Stephen Ash, the medical school class of 71. Dr. Ash, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. Uh, we will get a little bit into your the, the story in the interim, but tell us about your, your original background. You're on mute, Dr. Ash. Dr. Ash, you're, you're on, there you go. There. Uh, Yes, well, uh, Stephen Ash, I actually grew up in Kansas City, Johnson County, and went to Shawnee Mission North High School. Uh, now, Dr. Ash, was it Shawnee Mission North at the time, or was it Shawnee? Barely. Uh, we were the first uh, uh, class, I think, uh, after I gotcha. uh, And uh, uh, went to Northwestern undergrad in physics, uh, but when I decided to go to medicine, uh, came back to KU for medical school. Um, partly due to people like Dr. Jared Grantham and Dr. Scarpelli and Coppage and Pathology, I kind of fell in love with kidneys uh, and started doing kidney research while I was at, at KU, actually, uh, regeneration especially. Uh, but my wife was from Indiana and I decided for one year I was gonna go to uh, Indianapolis IU Med School for residency or uh, internship. And like a lot of people in residency, I just got stuck. So I've lived my entire life now in Indiana, uh, except for the wonderful years in Kansas City, I still consider Kansas City my home. Uh, I became a nephrologist and uh, joined a large multi-specialty group. And 50 years later, I'm still a nephrologist. I work part-time uh, with the same group. Uh, the... Uh, um, the practice is, uh, has allowed me to continue significant research activities, which have mostly focused around dialysis. Incidentally, right now, uh, I'd like to say this is my home, but this is the Garth Mansion in Hannibal, uh, the most colorful and, and historic way of getting from Indianapolis to, uh, <laughs> to Kansas City, yeah. is actually uh, through uh, uh, Illinois and Hannibal. So you're taking the Highway 36 route, not the Highway mm -hmm. 70. Route. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I favor that as well. Uh, you'll be happy to know, Dr. Ash, that the current dean of the School of Medicine, Dean Ojo, is a nephrologist. 
uh, yes, was, I did uh, know in an incredible uh, area. You'll hear more from him uh, later. So uh, Dr. Grantham, who is both a, a friend and a mentor to me as well, is sorely missed. Uh, his legacy lives on in this campus in so many ways, uh, much less he's got a, 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 a grandson in the current School of Medicine and one grandson oh, wow. who is a graduate and his son and I are very close friends as cardiologists. So Dr. Right. Grantham very, remains guy. very important to us uh, on this campus. Thank you for joining us. And, and then we have Joanne uh, Stoskoff, who is both a graduate of the School of Nursing and the School of Health, Health Professions in Salina, or currently living in Salina. Joanne, thank you for joining us this morning. Yes, I am Joanne Stoskoff and I do live in Salina, originally from the Abilene area. And uh, when I became involved with KU, KU and K-State had a dual degree. So I went three years to K-State and then on to KU for the last two clinical years and got my BSN. And then I continued on into the nurse anesthesia program and practiced anesthesia. My husband was also an anesthesiologist. So we kind of worked together and we practice in Wichita and then here in Salina. And I am retired now. Jo Joanne, in the world of Zoom, uh, many of us have used uh, fake backgrounds. If that's an actual background, you've got a lovely home. Well, thank you. <laughs> we, 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 we sometimes are judged. I've just got a mess behind me, but that's just who I am, so I apologize. My computer is usually in my laundry room, and I decided <laughs> that wasn't appropriate, so we yeah. moved to the family room. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that sounds great. So, so I want to start with kind of the unique environment that we're in. And I really want the students to share. It's been a hard 18 months for students and their learning experiences. And, and they've had different, an impact on the clinical experiences as well as on the di more didactic or lecture-based experiences. I thought maybe we'd start with Chi Chi. Chi Chi, how, how did this rush in March of 2020 to a new learning environment and subsequent changes how has it impacted you and your classmates in the School of Medicine? Yeah, I think it was definitely, it was a shocking change for all of us. And we didn't, certainly didn't expect to come into medical school and the field of medicine to expect such a thing to happen. Um, but I do want to say that I think the KU administration has really done its best to help transition this process. Um, and so when we had the shutdown back in March of 2020, that was at the near the end of my second year. And so that was preparing for the step one exams. And so for us, the lectures and everything were recorded and transitioned to Panopto, which is where we base our online lectures already. But um, I think the biggest change for us, not just during the capstone period where we were mostly studying at home already, was the initiation of M3 year, which was in June. And at that time, a lot of the rotations like the pediatrics and OBGYN were all housed, I think, for eight weeks virtually. I um, was fortunate enough to start on my surgical rotation. And so a lot of that, I think the clerkship directors had really pushed for having that maintained as in person, just given the surgical um, nature of the rotation itself. But I think for the first two months, I think it was really impactful for students to have um, the virtual electives and having to zoom in on patient interactions, being in, in iPads to wheel into different clinical rooms and stuff. But um, so I think the first rotation was really challenging for us to be housed on Zoom and we entered into the field of medicine for that human connection and for that um, patient care that we had expected to be in person. But again, I think KU had done its best in uh, initiating that section and then um, slowly transitioning all of our clerkships back to in person where it was possible. And so I think the first rotation clerkship rotation for us were largely housed on Zoom. And then initially, um, I think we were spacing out students giving social distancing and stuff to encourage in person. Um, I would say the other aspect of it is I think um, given just kind of spaces and stuff, students necessarily weren't um, allowed in the emergency room for, again, I think for space-wise, but also for safety purposes. So I think um, the emergency room is that special place where we have a lot of these initial diagnoses. And so I think students there have um, been kind of closed away. But again, as fourth year students and stuff, that's something that KU again has been really stressing that we do continue to have that exposure. Right, thank you, Chi Chi. So, so the School of Medicine on the preclinical side, given the fact that we've had a campus in Wichita in ITV connections, and now a campus in Salina for the last decade has allowed us to do much online uh, anyway. And so we were well adapted to do distance learning in the preclinical years, but the clinical years really were a challenge. Shelby, how did the, the clinical environment in School of Nursing 
uh, get adapted uh, in March of 2020 when you were in your about ready to start your last year, correct? Yeah, um, I agree uh, with what she said about KU really doing their best uh, to make us adapt to the situation. Um, the School of Nursing is also pretty uh, well adapted to the online format even before the pandemic. Um, so really the in classes, we just switched completely to online. Um, we do normally stream to Salina as well. Um, so they just pretty much picked up the lecture footage from that and then we were all online at that point. But something that did change for us was the clinical format. Um, we weren't allowed to finish spring of 2020 our clinicals. So we were pulled out halfway um, from the hospital. And then when we returned that fall um, of 2021, okay, I forget the dates, but you know, when we returned that fall, it all mushes together. But um, we were only allowed in the hospital for half um, of what we would have originally been. And so we were, I was doing my ICU rotation at that point. We were only allowed four hours a week on the ICUs, which is like nothing, you know? And then the last half of that, we were, um, we'd break off into small clinical groups and do sort of like, we go to a conference room and talk about stuff. So I really think the biggest thing that was impacted for us was that um, in-person clinical time. We don't have very much to begin with, so yeah. All right, uh, Aaron, during your, thank you, uh, Shelby. Aaron, during your PhD studies, how did COVID impact uh, the conduct of those studies? Yeah, well, during the shutdown, our big NIH funded trial through our lab was shut down. And I remember going into the lab and everyone was kind of scurrying around and they're like, I just got a massive stack of papers and I got sent home with like, we don't know how long we're going to be away from the lab, but you're going to do data entry until that changes. So for about, I think it was four to six weeks, I did a lot of data entry and then thankfully we got things going again. So I was able to resume human research. And from the didactic side, all our classes obviously moved online and that was difficult because when you have one of these within arm's reach and it's socially acceptable to look at it at your side while you're at a Zoom computer, it's more difficult in addition to all the other distractions that are, are at your home from I have a dog and other things. So it made learning a bit more difficult. I've always been a fairly social person. So I, we even now, we don't go into our shared lab space as much. We go in more than we did a year ago or at the start of the pandemic but we still are cognizant of that we are in a pandemic. So we, we, we space out our time and we have only a few people there at one time. So it's been, it's been different, but I do think we've done our best to deal with it. We, we got supplemental funding. Our big R01 trial didn't get too far behind. So overall, it's been a, an adaptable experience and I've enjoyed it, but it, it, it's definitely different. Uh, thank you, Aaron. I wonder if the students could comment. So, so the Zoom environment, which we ended up using a lot of, is either very impersonal because you're at a distance, or it's very personal because you're in each other's homes. And 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 as Shelby pointed out, sometimes you're not, you know, you you don't, you don't put a jacket and tie on, or you don't, you know. So you get you get very. How how important how difficult was that for students to kind of welcome their classmates into their houses or into their personal or am I overreading that at all? What what do you guys think? I guess I can start off. It, I didn't really ever think of it that or that way, but prior to my I recently moved apartments and now I live alone, but I had a roommate before, so my office quote unquote office was literally in my, my room. So I would go from my bed to the, the desk that was three feet away. And I do recall being a bit self-conscious about people seeing my bed in my background. So it, it, was, uh, it was interesting. And I did like having my camera off when possible just to, right. to avoid my, my bed space right. being seen. So right. yeah, definitely. A, you know, I a need a small point. group and many of the students, you know, really didn't want to be seen. Chi Chi, any thoughts from, your, your school of medicine classmates about the nature of that? Yeah, I think I was surprised a lot of our, um, in a lot of our didactic lectures and stuff, a lot of times the students would just have our cameras off. And so sometimes the lectures would come in and just be like black screens and stuff. But there were times where lectures encouraged students to, to turn our cameras on and stuff, just to encourage that kind of communal 
connection. And so a lot of the times I think students just literally found like a wall or something. That's what I did is just to sit with a wall because I things are a mess and you just wake up or something. But um, I think the other thing is that students were able to utilize the virtual backgrounds. And so we got to see some pretty fun stuff like you're with the palm trees in the back, which obviously, you know, wasn't the case. But <laughs> those are, I think, some creative ideas to go about that. So 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 Dr. Ash, the 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 campus that you came to, I guess in 1967 was an interesting time in the United States. It was an interesting time in the history of our city. Um, what, what were your impressions of campus? G give us a sense of where you were having lectures, what campus was like the first two years. We'll get into the clinical years later, but 67 and 68 were kind of, uh, they were kind of active times in the city, weren't they? Yes, they they were. Uh, they were they were tense times, um, and uh, I I was hoping that uh, there would be a period of long term peace after that. There kind of was, uh, but uh, we see the same tensions today resulting in uh, unfortunate uh, tendencies of group psychology over uh, <laughs> person. So, so, the, so the Kansas City riots were in the spring of 68, is that right? Nothing like that. And I remember uh, seeing, seeing the National Guardsmen walking around uh, uh, Plaza and uh, just like that. And it was tense. But, uh, you know, medical, medicine and, and uh, the knowledge uh, base of uh, biology and science is, is so huge and so... Uh, um, intriguing uh, that you know, within medical school and the class of a uh, hundred all in the same classroom uh, learning the same uh, uh, difficult materials it, it does kind of isolate uh, and right. even though uh, uh, um, the neighborhood at the time uh, you know was was clearly uh, middle to close center city uh, at the time, uh, it was uh, was a comfortable place to go. Um, there were a, a, a number of buildings you could count on two hands anyway. That I could find my way around the campus. And <laughs> I remember uh, a few years ago, fortunately, setting up a meeting with Dr. Grantham at the, at the University of Kansas. And I said, uh, he said, where do you want to meet? I said, well, let's meet at the fountain. So. I, I went to where the fountain used to be behind the main, the main entrance building. It was gone. Yeah, it's now in front of the Murphy yeah. building. <laughs> Fortunately, I saw Dr. Grantham walking down the street, and he said, I thought it was here, too. <laughs> um, so so, uh, Dr. Here. Ash, how many uh, classmates, and what was the breakdown in terms of men and women in your class? Of seven? <clears throat> um, I think we had a round number 100, something like that. And uh, if I remember, there were... 12 or 15 women, women. Uh, at that point. Uh, and uh, um, they were well accepted. In fact, I would have to say eagerly accepted you know, <laughs> by the rest of the class. Yeah. Uh, so, so we're now uh, to, to 11 with uh, eight in Salina and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, 20, uh, well, it, 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 it goes up to about 70 in Wichita for the last two, last two years. So oh. 24 for the first two years and, and, uh, and, uh, so, so is it about, is it about half the class or more? It, and men and women are, are been 50, 50 in medical education since 96 or 2000. It, yeah. And, uh, we, we, we could discuss that further. It, it's, but medical school app, uh, ad, acceptance and admissions are 50, 50. Uh, my wife is a veterinarian and went to Purdue University. That's ah. actually finished after we were married. And that class is, I think, 70% or 65% women. Women, yeah. And, and the medical school classes that are mostly women are the six-year medical schools that take straight out mm -hmm. of high school, like UMKC. Right. And the, the story I, is that most 18-year-old boys are not ready to make that decision. Yeah. They're not mature enough. Right. Mm -hmm. So to the dean of the vet school that they've got to be more inclusive these days. Yeah. <laughs> so so Joanne, you came from Abilene. 
you were in K State and then you came to Kansas City. What was campus like when you started as a as a nursing student? You know, the campus almost ended at 39th and Rainbow. There was really nothing north and very little west that I right. recall. So my life while I was there was pretty much enclosed just in the medical center. Right. And I became very involved in all my activities involved around that. Joanne, did you live in the nursing dorm? I did live in the nursing dorm. So what I, was that like at the time, Joanne? Well, that was a pretty um, strict place or kind of open and what, what was it like? It was relatively open. I think maybe the doors closed at 11 to get in, but uh, you could come in late if you signed in. But we had uh, two telephones in each hallway, and that was always kind of interesting in the dorm because <laughs> when the phone rang, everybody ran to see if it was for them. So was it very common to live in the, in the nursing dorm at Most the time? Most of my classmates lived in the dorm. We first year I lived in the dorm that's there right on 39th and Rainbow. The second year it was over the student union, which had been the men's dorm. So, right. Uh, Dr. Ash, did you live on campus or did you, yeah. you were from the area? So, where did you live during right. school? Uh, first two years I lived uh, actually with my parents in uh, uh, Prairie Village. Yep. Grove in. And, and, and then after that, uh, uh, my wife, uh, we married when oh, I was did. a junior, and we lived uh, in the Roland Park area. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so, so, uh, Chi Chi, where do most of the medical students live these days? How would you describe where they live? I think there's quite a bit that are living around the campus. So in the Rainbow um, Rainbow Ridge and other apartments near the campus area. But I also think there's a significant portion who are in the suburb area, Overland right. Park, Prairie Village area and stuff. So I would say, I don't know if the percentage would be 50-50, but some certainly are closer to campus and then some are farther away and they commute. Chi Chi, did uh, COVID change the distance that students were willing to move away from 39th and Rainbow or, or, or did that not come really come into play? I don't think that came into play. I think with the whole virtual transition, I think anywhere students were able to log in, but I don't think that that really impacted students' living situation. Right. Shelby, Shelby, would there be any interest in a nursing dorm like the old days? Would that have any relevance to today's students or is that a, a thing of the past? I think... I, I think the nursing situation for living is actually pretty interesting. A lot of, I did for my first year, lived in Lawrence. And a lot of my students, a lot of my peers lived in Lawrence and we would commute. <laughs> Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> oh, I was hoping it was a dog. <laughs> <laughs> He's back there. He might hear, hear something. But um, let me shut the door. So a lot of people live in Lawrence and commute because they're just, they went to Lawrence the first two years and they're not ready to give that life up. So um, I did that for one year. And then um, a lot of other people live around. Typically they live uh, right around campus. I live right on Springfield Street still. Um, so, gotcha. Yeah. Aaron, same thing with, with the School of Health Professions and the PhD students, kind of a dispersal across the community. I think so. I know in my department specifically, a, a fair amount of students live in the suburbs. I actually live downtown on the Missouri side, so not too far away from, from campus. But I'm crazy enough, I ride my bike up that hill, but it's, good for you. Yeah, it's 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 a painful ride. Good for you. Um, yeah, so it's I, I think it's a, it's a good mixture, and I know we have at least one faculty member that lives in Lawrence that that commutes, and I believe it may be a student or two that does the same. So I, I think that's yeah we we echo the other sentiments here. So so just out of for context, we have uh, employees living in twenty two states now. Some of them may not want us to know that, but uh, Lawrence has folks living in 41 states. So, so the, the off-campus work thing has changed how that, how that uh, takes place. And our HR department is, is challenged by, by both those facts. So Dr. Ash, you mentioned Dr. Grantham and so many of our experiences are ingrained in us, are those mentors and those, those folks we mentioned. Um, you mentioned Dr. Grantham. What other people had a really important profound impact um, what, what were the what were the the, the the sort of the students favorite teachers in the preclinical years let's start there oh uh, be careful some may still be here 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> some may still be there. Uh, you know, I would have to uh, uh, have to say some of, some of the most remarkable teachers were the the clinical uh, in the clinical state. Sure. So who were who were they? Um, Dr. Bollinger was yep. an endocrinologist yep. uh, and a wonderful teacher on the, yep. uh, on the rounds. Uh, by the way, one thing that was the hardest for me to learn, especially as a physicist, where the rules are simple and, and uh, the, the principles overreaching, uh, uh, was physical diagnosis. I mean, I, I, I thought, my gosh, there's, there's so much subjectivity and care and all of this. And I remember learning to, uh, to read the uh, uh, cardiac uh, uh, cycle from uh, the mechanical motion of the heart transmitted to a Q-tip held on the chest. Yeah. And uh, checking uh, for atrial contraction from jugular distension, all these things. And slowly I, I learned uh, those those skills, which which nowadays are are really quite foreign. I mean, the med students have heard of jugular venous distension and how it relates to volume, etc. But I mean, that was starting ground for me: how to check edema right and how to feel the liver and spleen and all these sort of things because the chest right. is so valuable. Um, but uh, <clears throat> in the uh, um, in the, the, uh, at the same time, I can't remember his name, but there was a pharmacologist who was just a terrorist to uh, medical students. And I remember him grilling me in the ICU once about the difference between a sedative and a drink and a, uh, uh, a, a sedative drug and a, a narcotic drug and was, was really uh, merciless. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, but there's, since everybody knew that's the way it was, it was just I was his victim that day, you know. But uh, boy, I went back and learned that pretty well. So, uh, oh, that was great. And in the in the research area, you know, the, Dr. Grantham was just a remarkable person. Anyone interested in uh, how many uh, adversities can be overcome by a single physician in his in his in getting to training? Read the book uh, "Why I Why I Study Urine" yeah. uh, by Jared Grantham. What a childhood and setbacks that he survived, including polio, an iron lung, being hospitalized at KUMC, etc. He 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 was one of the most incredible academic or slash people that many of us have ever met. Mm -hmm. How many people survive what he did at his age later in life and then came back? <laughs> And I'll right. never forget. It may have been the conference. That, was the conference that you attended to honor to honor him at the Intercontinental that night uh, several years ago? No, I, I missed that unfortunately. So he 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 uh, presented his upcoming specific games for his most recent grant as yeah. a way of. Uh, I I do remember his national award at ASM must have been 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and he got up in the, the American Society of Nephrology is huge. There's 13,000 yeah. nephrologists all over the world. There are five or 6,000 in one room. He gets up and the mic goes dead, just like that. And he waits and waits and waits. The mic comes back and he said, I knew my ideas were unpopular, but I didn't think you'd go this far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joanne, who were, the, who were the teachers that you remember from the medical center at that time? Uh, I guess I really, featured in on the med surge people because yep. that tends to be where I headed to go and all that was so very important. I remember Evelyn Hutchison and Jean Quisenberry and a number of teachers that had a big influence on my practice in the future in, in anesthesia because I used everything that they taught from pediatrics to everything. So. Right, so, so Joanne, I'm gonna turn the subject a little bit. You live in Salina. And now there's a school of medicine and a school of nursing in Salina. Yes. What's, what has the school's um, impact on the community been from your perspective? 
Well, I think the community is very proud to have it here. The facility is just absolutely wonderful. I hope they appreciate compared to the way we began way oh. back in years ago. Right. It's just fantastic. All the simulation uh, labs that they have, it, I, I think the community really does support a, a organization I am gives scholarships to nursing students. So it has a big impact and when, when, you, when you think about a community the size of Salina with now 48 nursing students and, uh, 20, and uh, uh, yeah, 30, 24 medical students, it really changes uh, it, it, 36 minutes, but well, wait a minute, my 32 medical students, it really changes how the community plays out. It's very exciting. Uh, and, the, and the facility there uh, would not be there without the great support of the folks of North Central Kansas and Salina. And so we're so very proud. Uh, the last time the, uh, the uh, LCME came through to credit the medical school, uh, one of the surveyors said, if I came to KU, I'd go to Salina. I it's, think it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It yeah, is. it's really, it's, it's, it's really, really great. Um, and that kind of gets us to facilities. Um, you know, we, we have the recently built uh, campus uh, updates in Wichita in 2010, 11. We have the new campus in Salina, and then we've built uh, 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 the, the health education building uh, in Kansas City, which I, I don't think maybe Dr. Ash, you've seen. Uh, Chi Chi, do you want to mention what the going to class in the back when we used to go to class in person, what it was, what the HEB meant to the students? Yeah, of course. I think I mean, I'm, I was part of the class that I think was one of the first few classes of, of medical students who were able to really um, engage with the HEB building. And it's it's a beautiful facility. So whenever you have the chance, I think it's it's um, a good experience to experience it. But I think the students enjoy the large lecture halls where we're able to have different small groups and sit and communicate with students, but also engage with the faculty members. There are also other small groups where we're able to have our um, case-based learning times. And so I think it was really intentionally built and architected to have those large group spaces, but also small group space spaces to facilitate learning as well as um, community. But I do also want to emphasize that I think it has also, um, as a humanities um, person, as a person who enjoys humanities, there is also quite an artistic background to the HEB, which I didn't know until um, a couple of years ago, where um, there's artwork all around the different floors that are interlacing medicine with um, art and humanities, but also just the architecture of it, I think, um, behind it. And also the Oculus is there now. So I think it's just a beautiful place to really embrace all of medicine and what medicine means. Thank you, thank you for that, Chi Chi. Uh, uh, Dr. Ash, if you get on campus, you do need to see the the, uh, the sculptor sculpture that was was uh, was put there to represent uh, to really thank Dr. Grantham for his role in the development of uh, the Takeda Great. drug. And uh, and you have to get your sort of sense. It it looks like cis to me, but it it doesn't necessarily to everybody. But it's it's very uh, it's it's uh, it, it's it's very great. Shelby, what what what's the HEB been like for School of Nursing? Or maybe you weren't in there for very long. No, we I had I only had a uh, I had two years in that building. Um, but anyways, uh, it was nice. Um, it's much, in my opinion, much nicer uh, than the School of Nursing. Like, I'm very glad that we got to have classes in the HEB. Um, we also got to use uh, some of the simulation labs and stuff, um, which are very nice. Uh, yeah, I agree with everything that uh, Chi Chi said. Right. And, and Aaron, your experience on campus, the facilities have been mostly in the, in the research side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a few classes in the health education building. They were very nice. I liked having the, the break rooms with refrigerators so you could leave your lunch or have a snack there between classes, which was great. And a really good place to study too. You could post up in a corner in a, a nice little desk that was very sound isolated or even get a room with whiteboards when you're, when you're going through biochem pathways. It's always nice to have a lot of white space to write those down and the HAB had plenty of those. So yeah, it's been a good experience thus far. Terrific. Um, we have uh, uh, really um, part, of, uh, part of our experience as, as learners is really getting to know our, our classmates. Joanne, do you keep in touch with classmates over the years? Has that been important for you or 
or are you a occasional reunion person or how? There, there are several KU nurses here in Salina and we have done events for the new program that they have yeah. here in Salina and uh, the nurses do get together every now and then. Yesterday, I was with an OKU nurse, and we got our memories together. And what fun it is right. to! Right. So, Joanne, I, you're going to for, forgive me for this, but where were you, where where were you in the training of in in the use of uniforms and caps and yes. all that? Maybe remind Shelby what it was like to you know sort of the. We had blue physical manifestation. We had blue striped uniforms with white little bibs, and we wore caps. We were just at the tradition, the time when they were changing from wearing caps. But we had the capping ceremony and everything. But we did wear our little uniforms. And I remember going out to in the public health rotation. We would go ride the city buses in our uniforms and go to all places in the city to see patients who we were following up with. But we, it was. What, what was that like, uh, Joanne, going out into the community like that? Was that, did you go out individually or in groups or we, was that ner was that nerve wracking at the time? And we, everybody just assumed that if we had our little uniforms on, we were going out to help people. I went to North Kansas City all around on the bus and did not feel uncomfortable at all. Never, wow, <laughs> wow. And, and Shelby, do you want to maybe tell Joanne about the, about the, the nightingale ceremony and how that works now yeah, instead, instead of the capping. Yeah, instead of caps, now we get we do get white coats um, that we purchase at the beginning. And then um, uh, we just have a ceremony, you know, similar to probably what you had, um, but just with white coats. And also right. pinning. We have little pins that we get at the end. Right. Dr. Ash, do you keep up with classmates uh, over the years? Uh, keep up with uh, colleagues? So, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I've, I'm coming to Kansas City for a, a group uh, dinner tonight with the class of 71. And how many will be attending? Do you have an idea? Maybe uh, uh, Jordan knows. Do you know? Uh, about 30. 30, uh, that's great. Yeah. And uh, there, there's many more that uh, are still around, but, but weren't... Uh, able to be contacted right so so uh, doc, dr ash the um you were a four-year program at the time correct yes that's right the three-year program had not started yet i think is that right no that yeah that's that right had not started yeah we're that, working was, our way towards the 50 right. years of the yeah, which 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 was nice because that gave me summers off uh basically right. and uh, i spent every one of those summers in research in a, in a laboratory. Uh, right. it was off the first two years, that is. Uh, after that, it was the usual uh, clinical full rotations. Yeah, while some medical schools have are now adapting to a three-year program, I think right. most of the feedback of our experience is that it takes another year for people to figure out what they wanna do, whether they're still in medical school or not. And so many yeah. did a, a, a rotating internship or some sort of internship that allowed them to then get direction later. Right, you know, like a, like a lot of things in education, uh, you, you, you're in a real hurry to get through it. Right. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I remember thinking so many things were irrelevant and hearing comments of the classmates, that, you know, why in the world do we neuro need to learn about the bursa and thymus of chickens, for example? Yeah. And, uh, or the renal aldosterone network. I mean, uh, that, forget it, you know. Uh, and then you go into practice. And not only that, but so much more is relevant. It takes a while to, to sink in. Right, uh, right. I would have taken the three-year, a two-year, one-year program if I could have, but I, I'm glad I did. Right. Uh, Dr. Ash, uh, you were on the, the later side of the Vietnam or did many of your yeah. classmates go into the military? Did they have military commitments or was, was that uh, still relevant? Yes, and I unfortunately had a, a fairly low draft number myself. Me uh, meaning to those who are not initiated, meaning a, a small number that was more likely to get drafted. Yes, right. So uh, uh, deferment was, uh, was the general option 
And uh, uh, many of my classmates, I think 50% of my classmates uh, took a deferment, which meant that you would serve in the military. Uh, As a uh, medic. A couple of years after uh, finishing fellowship training. I decided to uh, um, not to do that, to leave my options a bit more open and take my chances. And as it was, I was not drafted eventually. I don't know whether it helped that I moved out of Kansas <laughs> or not. I never did find that out. I doubt that they had my address. But uh, so enough of my uh, colleagues chose the Berry Plan that that filled the military's needs at least through 75. Right. Right. Um, that was a concern. Um, uh, you know, quite frankly, I've uh, in talking to those who chose the deferment and the military service. It was a great experience for most. Yeah. Yeah. We have heard over the years from in the last four or five years from many who who, who did that. Um, yeah. I, I wonder if the students could talk about how COVID, how it how it's impacted your ability to develop strong relationships with classmates as plus or minus, or is it cause people to come together? Or is it cause people to stay at odds? Uh, uh, Shelby, any thoughts? Yeah, I can speak on that. Um, I think uh, we had a class of 115 nursing students and I just feel like uh, we did make our little, we did meet people that first semester, um, but that was really our only chance to really, you know, meet people in person, get their phone numbers. Da, 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 da. So um, that's where I met my friend group. And then that's the friend group that I had the entire time. So I think it was a little bit more challenging to make friends uh, outside of your initial friend group. Right. Chi Chi, what do you think? I think for the current M3 and M4 classes, we were able to have in person, at least for at least for the first year or so. And so a lot of the times we have established our social connections, but I think for the current M2s, I think the whole year was largely virtual. And so they didn't meet in person. And so I think that was certainly a challenge, especially for students who are either non-traditional or out of state and didn't have that in-state or familiar ties to Kansas. So I think certainly the pandemic had an impact on the social life of students. Aaron, what do you think? It's definitely hindered it. Like Chichi, I was fortunate enough. I was here almost a year or so before COVID started. So I had friends in my, my program and into my lab. But once COVID happened, we no longer had networking events. Our labs stopped doing happy hours. So I do think it was much more difficult to keep those friendships and make new ones because of the pandemic. Right, right. Uh, you know, some things uh, uh, are similar in, in that regard of the importance of contacts and friendships. Some things are different. One of the things that's different is, is uh, tuition. Dr. Ash, you remember what medical school tuition was in 1967? Mm -hmm. Not exactly, but I think maybe $300 a semester, something like that. I'm sorry, did you say $300 a semester? Yeah, something like that. We're going to have the endowment people stop by to talk to you about what the return of investment was on those $300. <laughs> uh, so someone who was similar Dr. Ash, who went away to a private university and came back mm -hmm. to, to public medical school, I'm betting Northwestern wasn't $300 at that time. Uh, actually, it was pretty close when I went there, but a lot more when I left. A lot more when you left. It increased. increased so, Wayne, do you remember what nursing school was, tuition? You know, I don't remember, but I do remember when I graduated, I had to pay a fee for borrowing money for $198. Can you imagine that? <laughs> that was my loan. And I, I, I don't recall, but I know that at K-State, it was $104 a semester. I do remember that, but I don't remember what it was. It's amazing with 50 years. Okay, Chi-Chi, <sighs> what's, what's medical school tuition like these days? Oh, God. I think, where do I even start? Just kidding. I think for in-state tuition, I want to say each semester is like 16000 That's then, That's I don't, all I don't in. Even know. That's not, that's all in. That's tuition and and and, and living and everything. And like living all and in stuff. 60. Yeah. It's about thirty eight. I think, uh, tuition now. 38000 a year for tuition. Average student na nationwide is about, leaves with just over $200,000 of debt. Um, and... Uh, and the, for the School of Medicine, the curves, you know, I, I was probably near the crossover year where students were starting to pay a significant portion 
Um, but uh, the state has backed away in an in a incredible way from supporting education and turning that over to students to do that. And it's, it is a, um, it's the nature of our of state universities these days. Shelby, do you remember, do you, do you know what nursing tuition was? Um, roughly, I want to say like 3,000, 4,000 a semester. Honestly, I have no idea. So how did you, don't, how did you pay it then? Just, um, combination of, um, my dad and financial. Perfect. Perfect. Aaron, I assume you're not paying for tuition for your PhD. Uh, I'm very fortunate that, yeah, we're, we're grant funded. So I have a tuition waiver and a stipend. Right. Right. So, so clearly the debt students are taking these days is, 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 demonstrably different from from the time. Dr. Ash, was there a match in 1971? Uh, yes. yes. There so, um, so you, and, uh, you were in a match to go to the University of Indiana? Uh, right. And my three choices were uh, uh, Indiana, uh, Iowa, uh, which is a beautiful campus, and KU. Okay. And, 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 and you did the same thing. You, you interviewed and then you list your match ranks. Yes. Yes. Right. And I, so, I do think the on-site interview uh, was uh, um, really a valuable experience. I hope they still do that. Well, that's a sore point. And Chi Chi's yeah. going to tell us about the on-site. What's the status uh, of the on-site interview? Chi -Chi. Because the, uh, for one thing, uh, by the way, of mine, uh, our medical school interview at the University of Kansas was uh, in groups of three. Yep. So we had a couple of professors and three students. And it was very interesting listening to the uh, answers from my colleagues uh, to the questions. And they would often pass them around. Uh, but, but in the other towns, visiting there and seeing what it's really like to, to go from where you're going to live or wherever that's going to be or to, to campus, et cetera. It was just, it was, it was helpful. Right. Chi Chi, what's the status of uh, uh, maybe walk through for the group, what, where you are in the, in the match situation and what's the status with interviews? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the match, um, I guess, deadline where we all submit our applications was this past um, Wednesday, so September 29th. And so right now, currently, the fourth year med students are in that waiting period for interviews. Um, but unfortunately, this year, like last year, our interview cycles are largely, I think, virtual. I think some specialties, there is that option, they say, of either going virtual or in person. And they say that if you do choose to go in go virtual interviews, then you're not necessarily affected by your ranking status. So um, I think that's just a select few. But again, this interview cycle is largely virtual, um, held on Zoom. And um, and so I think their tours and stuff, the, the general kind of evening night social gatherings will be all hosted via Zoom. And so that is just a, a, a distance removed from that in-person connection that we would have had if we were in person. So uh, Dr. Ash, uh, in addition to the many changes that Chi Chi mentioned, the the step one exam is, is going to be going pass fail. Chi Chi, is that in the next year or two that that's going to happen, I think? Yeah, I think the current second years are the first year of pass fail for step pass one. Pass fail. So back in February of, two th of 2020, I was at a national meeting of the LCME and that happened. And we thought that is going to be the biggest thing that's going to happen at, me at medical education in a generation. And then COVID hit and it seems like a trivial concern. Uh, now to all the all the changes that took place, Joanne. When you left um, the the nursing program, did you go right into the the nurse anesthesia program? And was that common at the time? It was just relatively the beginning of the nurse anesthesia program at KU, and I did. I just after I took my nursing boards and passed, I went directly into the program, and it was a two year program where we rotated all the different services and then boards and. Right. And, and is it correct that now you need to have some nursing experience before you yes. shall be saying yes, that's, that's yes. my understanding. Yes. Some ICU experience before you become a yes. Much eligible. As, 
much has changed in anesthesia. I was at the very beginning. I remember my experience at KU. There were four EKGs for the 12 operating rooms there. And if we wanted to have an EKG for a crate heart in case or something, we'd have to go early and hide it so that we would have it for the case. And you know, that just would be unheard of yeah. now. And now we have modern watches. Yes, so and the monitors it. are just so profound. Go figure. So Yes. Yeah. Jordan, if there are questions from the group, we'd be delighted to, to interact with any of those questions uh, uh, should, should they come up. Absolutely. Um, I would love to invite people to, to type in the, excuse me, type in the chat. We don't have any at this moment. And we can, uh, if people have questions, we can work through the, through the, uh, uh, through the town hall. Aaron, what's the next step for you after you get your PhD? What do you, where do you see your career going? That's the, you know, the million dollar question. I'm going to ask on behalf of your parents and your family members. <laughs> my, both my mentors, they want me to do the traditional academics. So do a postdoc, get a, a tenure track position. And I, I do see benefit in that and having academic freedom. However, I've helped with three grants and I don't know if I want to write grants to pay my salary for the rest of my life. So I'm keeping my options open and I've chatted with a few industry people also. So we'll see, we are working on a, my fourth grant actually, that if it gets funded, it will be tough for me to walk away from. So I, I think I'll probably do a postdoc, especially if funding comes through for this because it is a really cool project that I'm really excited about, but I, Aaron, I, I'm uncertain. The, the area that you're involved in is just so critically important, you know, and, and it's going to just become more and more important uh, that, um, you know, I always say you got to ask in important questions in important areas. And clearly you're working in a highly, highly important area and for our country and in a community. So, you know, I'm sure there'll be sure, sure there'll be great opportunities. Shelby, are nights your future or do you see um, or do you see uh, other aspects of a nursing career? Um, I just started nights, you know, about a month ago, so I'm pretty fresh on it, but um, I actually kind of like it. It's pretty chill so far, but um, in the future, I do want to um, possibly go the anesthesia track. I have shadowed CRNAs, um, so it's interesting to hear Joanne's stuff because that's something that interests me in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Chi Chi, a question in the chat was, how many uh, uh, programs does someone apply to uh, in general? And now we'll take psychiatry, for, for example. Yeah, of course. So psychiatry, I think over the past five years, it's actually gotten more competitive. And so this year, I personally applied to 55 programs. And I know I was talking to some mentors who even a couple of years ago applied. Dr. Ash's <laughs> jaw just fell <laughs> off the screen when you yeah. said 55. Yep. And so, and I think that's, that was the recommended. There are some, we have like Reddit spreadsheets and stuff, and some people are applying over 50, over 80, over a hundred. It's, it's yeah. gotten really crazy. So, so for those, so is it, others might be, be aware that the AAMC does have data that suggests how many, what the, what sort of the, the likelihood ratios are, if you're an American graduate and, and you know, how many you should apply to, but, but that's all theoretical. And, and some people take that, the answer for some programs is all of them, is all of them. It's unbelievable. And, and yes, Dr. Ash, the, the visit is important. However, it's also expensive. And so it's a, it's a balance there. So some of the challenges that we're facing is when you, when you make the, the virtual visits free and easy, then the best take all of them. And then there's not spots for, for others, which which is a a a a a, a, a bit of a challenge. But uh, it is uh, it it's been it's been very it's been a very tough time for our students, quite frankly. And the ones that you've seen here are are part of the great surviving mass that have have survived during this. But I think what Chi Chi just mentioned about the importance of of, of psychiatry and, and behavioral and mental health, that is an increasingly important part of what what we what students are exposed to and deal with. Chi Chi, did did the did 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 that sort of play into your choice of psychiatry as a future? 
Yeah, I, I part of why I love psychiatry is that innate connection you have with people, um, but also just really thinking about these larger questions of human motivations and behaviors and perceptions, how we think and behave and react. And especially in the current challenging state, I think that's more um, evident. And I think that's something that I'd hope to address or participate in these conversations in the future. Right, right. It's been, uh, and, and, and psychiatry is becoming a more, a more common. We, the, the School of Medicine retains, uh, was named in the top 10 for the US News and World Report for primary care medical schools this year for the first time. And that the basis for that was that our graduates practice primary care and continue to practice primary care um, long into their career, which is something that we're, we're very, very proud of. Um, we are at the bottom of the hour and I wanna thank Dr. Ash and Joanne Stoskov and our students for participating today. I hope our guests found it informative. We're gonna move on to a town hall. Uh, at, at, uh, at uh, I guess it would be 10 o'clock central time. We look forward, we wish you the best. Uh, Dr. Ash, we hope you have a great reunion. Uh, and Joanne, it was, it was wonderful to have you on board and appreciate all the support in Salina. So thank you, thank you all. And we hope you have a wonderful alumni weekend. Take care, thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you both so much for participating. Have a good day.